Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to ask Deacon Dodd if he would open us up with a word of prayer for tonight. session uh, up until summer on Tuesdays because we still have our leadership group on Wednesdays once a month until June. Uh, and we don't want people to have to choose and, you know, they signed up for the leadership class. And we don't want to compete with that. So please send a new notification out for me. Uh, on tomorrow, we are hosting Smart Start of Forsyth County. Uh, at 530, there'll be refreshments. Six o'clock, they will have a panel and it is all things early childhood. If you have young children, if you uh, work with young children, if you are an educator, if you have a daycare center, if you work at a daycare center, they have all of this information uh, that they're going to share on tomorrow. Uh, it is a free forum, so please come out. Uh, and then on Saturday from one to three, we have our annual Easter egg hunt. Uh, the next Saturday, April 6th, uh, we will be on, that is a Saturday, and that is at 5 o'clock. We will be at Mount Olive Baptist Church. I'll be preaching for Dr. Gray's anniversary. If you have not gotten tickets, I'm told that they are completely sold out. Uh, I had a few people to contact me, uh, and that's what they are telling people when they call. So they must be full. Um, and then, of course, on this Sunday, we will be celebrating what? Resurrection Sunday. Amen. A.K.A. Easter. And so I want you to do something for me. I want you to invite all your family members and folks who don't typically go to church, your colleagues, your friends, your frenemies, your enemies, uh, see if we can get them to come to uh, church on Sunday because a lot of people that don't go to church, they are still believers, amen? They still believe in Jesus Christ and who knows, they may come and feel something moving in their heart that makes them wanna become a part of Emmanuel Baptist Church and get engaged with the kingdom of God, amen? on Saturday, April the 13th at 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, our Congress of Christian Education with the Rowan Baptist Association, of which I am the first vice president, we will be holding a one-day session. Uh, there will be three rounds of classes. There are 30 different classes you can choose from, so you get to take uh, three different classes. They have three different sections, the early, the middle, and the end. You can, you can stay until one o'clock and take three different classes. Uh, you do not have to pay for it. The church is registering, so all you got to do is tell them you're from Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, if you uh, are not on social media and you're not my Facebook friend or see my pages on social media, send me a friend request uh, because I put a lot of our things on my personal page, and Brother Zant puts all of the things that we send him on the church's pages. Uh, that is uh, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And we want to continue to pray for, we've got a lot going on with uh, sickness uh, in, in our body, uh, uh, this local body of believers. And then we have quite a few people who have lost loved ones. I believe, get, uh, correct me if I get the name wrong, the Miles family lost their son. I spoke to them when they were on their way back home. Please keep them in prayer. He was in his 20s. And so we know that this is hard for them. We know Brother Scipio uh, is uh, still 
I don't know if he got out of the hospital. They had put him back in the hospital. He's been in and out, but we want to continue to pray for him. We want to pray for uh, Brother Milner, Sister Milner's husband. Uh, we want to continue to pray for him. We know that she is his caretaker. Uh, and I know I'm going to leave a lot of people out, but all of those folk that you know, uh, if you know some people are sick or need a phone call from me or visit, uh, please text me. Uh, their name and number, what's going on with them, and what's needed, whether they want me to call, they want me to come see them, or what it is. Uh, I, don't, I don't get 100%, but I try to do pretty good. I try to stay in the positive, and I try to at least give people a phone call to check on them and pray with them. Uh, and I think it's Sister Andrews I spoke with, I think, on yesterday, who uh, has cancer, and so she needs our prayers also. She's going through treatment now. Uh, then we got the, the Walls, their son, uh, also going through some cancer treatments. He's in his 20s. We want to pray for him. Uh, we just got a lot going on, all right? And so let's continue to pray for one another, particularly those of us that we know are struggling. And please continue to let our deacon ministry and myself know, uh, don't ever think, uh, well, they already know, so I'm not going to tell them. I'd rather get told three or four times than not to get told at all. Amen, brother deacons. Amen, sister deacons. All right, they nodding. <laughs> I got one amen back there. Listen, let's get started tonight. Uh, we are still dealing with this difficult issue that we call theodicy. Attempting to answer the deep delving, debilitating question, why does God, a good God, a loving God, allow evil and suffering to exist in this world? We just, I just got through talking about some of the suffering, right? On last week, we established that the culprits of our current condition was two black people named what? Adam and Eve. Now listen, last week, y'all let me do all the talking. This week, if you got a comment or a question or something you wanna add, raise your hand, and when I get to a stopping point, I'll stop and we can dialogue. Uh, we don't want this just to be a lecture, we want this to be a dialogue, okay? Matter of fact, a trialogue, how about that? The pulpit, the pew, and God, all of us having a conversation. All right, last week, we talked about Adam and Eve, uh, two black people named Adam and Eve. I said two black people. Look at somebody and tell them two black people. Yeah, I do believe that Adam and Eve were black. The original inhabitants of the world were black. The original Jews were black. The original Romans and Greeks were black. If, if, you, if you really do a deep delve and you look at France and you look at Germany, matter of fact, uh, this week, uh, all of this stuff has been coming out. Remember last week I mentioned that there, they have pictures of the, uh, in antiquity of the early Christians and disciples, and, and we didn't know it, but they have them hidden in these places in these different countries, and they are black, and they haven't told us all of these years. As a matter of fact, every ethnic group that you see originated from the melanated skin of our black ancestors. Ask Vladimir Putin. Right? Anybody seen those posts this week? Anybody seen on the news? Well, Vladimir Putin uh, unveiled some, some photographs that they have stolen from somewhere else uh, centuries ago. And when you look at Jesus and the disciples, their skin is black. Some people have tried to say that over time it just darkened, but here's the crazy thing, their clothes didn't get no darker. So they're trying to say the faces got darker because of time, but the clothes still are yellow and blue and all of these vibrant colors. No, they black. Look at somebody and tell them they black. Now, I mentioned on last week that the Vatican in Rome has a picture of the baby Jesus and, and Mary, the Madonna, in their basement. Guess what color they are? They are black. Y'all, if you read books, now you can just go on social media and everything I say to you, you can go on YouTube and social media and you can find this stuff. If we just do the research, we will discover, here's, here's, here's what I sincerely believe, and I believe that I can prove it through scholars who have studied it, that the original human beings on this earth were black. Black people can make white babies, but white people cannot make black babies. Are y'all hearing me? So it started with black and then every color of the rainbow throughout the centuries has come to be. If you look at most of our families, we got people as dark as you can get, as light as you can get. My family is like that. Amen, somebody. So, so we've got to start embracing the fact, some people think that when we say that we come from kings and queens that we just making this stuff up. No, there was a time when black people ruled the world. 
Amen, somebody. And some of these folk are afraid that it's going back to that. Because you do know that we are in the majority in the world. We may not be in the, the majority in the United States, but black and brown people, melanated people are in the majority when you take the world's population. Amen, somebody. So we talked about Adam and Eve were placed in a garden that contained everything that they needed for their survival, right? Problem is that instead of God programming them as God had done to all the other animals, God in God's infinite wisdom decided to give human beings free will, which means we have the ability and the prerogative to choose. Anybody in here want to be like an animal? Just be programmed? Yeah, but he gave you free will and you mess up half the time. Somebody don't say amen, say ouch. All right, all right, I'm trying to keep y'all awake tonight. So unlike the animal world, we talked about we are well aware of our actions and the consequences that they may create, but God gave us free will, which means that we have the ability to choose between right and wrong, good and bad, wickedness and righteousness. Some might ask the question, why did God give us free will? Well, first of all, if he had not given us free will, and we operated off of instinct like all the other beings on the earth, we would be nothing more than just another species of an animal. There would be no difference in our modus operandi, the method and manner in which we operate. How many of you know tonight that God loves you? Y'all really believe that? Look at somebody and tell them God loves you. God loves you. God loves us so much that God designed us with free will the ability to make our own choices because God does not want us to love God because God programmed us to or because God made us love God. God wants us to love God because we choose to love God. God wants our love to be voluntary and not mandated and forced. The problem us humans have is the difficulty of wrapping our minds around why a good and loving God would allow evil and suffering to exist in this world. Our real problem is we feel like God is to blame for all the evil and the suffering because God is omnipotent and has all power in God's hands. I had a couple of folk to come up to me last week and say, this is a hard teaching. Why? Because in our humanity, we got to have somebody to blame, right? We either blaming God or we blaming somebody else. Some of us even want to blame the devil. But the devil has never forced any of us to do anything in this room, has he not? Anybody in here the devil ever took his hand and put it on your hand and made you touch something that you shouldn't have been touching? Anybody ever took your feet and made you walk and go somewhere where you shouldn't have been? Anybody, has the devil ever, uh, uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm going to just say, has the devil ever took your clothes off and threw you in the bed with somebody? Huh? Has the, has the devil ever grabbed your tongue and made you cuss somebody out? Oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> you ought to cut that out. We got to have somebody to blame, right? First of all, how, how, how often do you look yourself in the mirror and say, what part did I play in this? How, how often do you have a situation with another human being or you just have a situation that's a negative in your life? Maybe it's not even another human being. Maybe, maybe it's just something that happened in your life. How often do we sit down and say, okay, this ain't God's fault. The devil didn't make me do it. I messed this up. Now I got to deal with the consequences and get to where God wants me to be. Truth of the matter is that all of us need to do some self-reflecting at times. Amen, somebody? First of all, you got to understand that God may allow evil and suffering in the world. Watch this. But God does not sanction evil and suffering in the world. God may allow it, but God does not like it. As a matter of fact, God hates evil and suffering and wickedness. Am I right? Proverbs 6 and 16 says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven 
that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and the seventh one is one who sows discord among the brothers and might I add sisters. Can I read that list again? It says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to him. Listen to these. Haughty eyes. What's that? Arrogance, right? You look down on folk. A lying tongue. God, the proverb says God hates that. Hands that shed innocent blood. Can I tell you that y'all better be careful how you treat folk who have not done anything to you? You better be careful because I'm a living witness that when you know you're doing right and you're trying your best to do the right thing and you're trying to please God and you're trying to treat people right, the Bible says that the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. And I have seen over the years that when folk are trying to do right by God and do right by their fellow human beings, when folk keep messing with them, that person don't have to do a thing because God steps in and handles it on their behalf. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that, de that devises wicked plans. When y'all hear this, I want you to reflect on your own self. Right, because when we start talking about stuff like this, we start other people's faces popping our heads. No, let your face pop in your head, right? Are you doing any of these things? A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. You ain't running away from evil like Job, you running to it. A false witness who breathes out lies. He done mentioned lies twice. And a person who sows discord. Y'all know what that is, right? You, you're making trouble. You're causing problems. You're whispering in people's ears. You're pitting this person against another person, and then you throw rocks, and then you put your hands behind your back. God, the, the proverb says that God hates those things. Psalm 5 and 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers, talking about God. Psalm 11 and 5 says, The Lord tests the righteous but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Look at somebody and tell them, God hates evil. Secondly, secondly, I think that we give God too much credit when it comes to evil, wickedness, and suffering. I said we give God too much credit because it is not God who does wickedness, evil, and suffering. Am I right? It's not God who does it. God only allows it. So as I said before, and I'm going to keep saying this, if you want to blame somebody for wickedness, evil, and suffering in the world, blame Adam and Eve, but you've got to understand that the blame does not stop there because humankind has followed in the footsteps of its progenitors. We are skilled at doing wicked and evil things and inflicting suffering on one another. God is not the progenitor of wickedness, evil, and suffering. We are. Are y'all hearing me? We talked last week about the first murder that was committed was in the very next chapter after Adam and Eve disobeyed God when their son Cain killed their elder son, their, old, their other son, Abel. And it has been going on ever since. Every generation gets more and more evil, more and more wicked, and inflicts more and more suffering on pain and pain on one another. So if you want to blame somebody, we have no one to blame but ourselves because the farther humankind moves away from God, the worse things will continue to get because we can't take a hint. Amen, somebody. The farther away from God that humankind gets, the more wickedness and evil we see, the more suffering and sadness we see, the more chaos and violence we see, the more natural disasters we see, and the more messed up this world becomes. And it is an outright consequence of our disobedience to our God. God is trying to get our attention to get us to turn from our wicked ways. 
But we just ignore God and we keep tearing God's world apart. And this is all consequential of the fact that God and God's divine wisdom and God's divine will decided to make human beings special and equip us with free will, which gives us the ability to make our own choices, whether it is in God's will or not. How many of you are honest enough to admit that a lot of your choices that you make and a lot of decisions that you make, I'm not going to ask you for a percentage, but you will admit that there are times when you make decisions that are out of God's will. There are times when you do things that's out of God's will. There are times when you say things that are out of God's will. And sometimes we mess up and God will remove the consequences, but then there are other times when we got to live with the consequences. You find that in David's life. You find that in Samson's life. If you read a lot of the bi biblical characters, you will discover that the power of God was on them and in them, and they were living and doing God's will, but a lot of them, just about every character in the Bible, messed up along the way because they made decisions that was out of God's will, and they had to pay the consequences. And what we want God to do is to wipe the consequences away. We want to mess up and then say, God, fix it. I don't want to have to go through the aftermath of some bad decisions that I made. Amen, somebody. Any questions or comments before I move on? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Both of them do it. Great question. <laughs> Y'all hear that? They knew they weren't supposed to eat it, so why did he eat it anyhow? And the only answer I got is human nature. Humans, we want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it, with who we want to do it. And watch this. I'm talking about Christians. And a lot of us don't care what God got to say about it. Am I right? Come on, talk to me. Huh? Okay, I, I heard most of that. We got a microphone? Yeah. Turn it on. I don't know. We don't know. We're going to hear you first. Right. I'm not perfect. <laughs> right. You speaking for all of us. You speaking for all of us. The goal is to get closer to perfection, right? We will never achieve perfection in our humanity we will, but until we get to the other side, and then the Bible says we will be like Jesus, right? So, yeah, that's our goal. The goal, are we trying? That's the question. Sometimes I wonder if a lot of Christians that I meet or a lot of Christians that I know, I wonder if we even given it a good faith effort. Is it really that hard just to try to do right by people? Yes, sir. Yes. But I think it's that patience. Yes. Right. And a lot of times 
We will ask God to do something, but God don't move fast enough for us, so we do it ourselves. Anybody in here ever done that? And then you mess it all up, and then you, God finally shows up and does what God was going to do anyhow. You're like, man, I just should have waited on God. You're right. We are impatient in our humanness. And, when, and, and we, have, we have had this, this, this faulty theology that we've been hearing since the 80s. It's died off some now that, that treats God like God does what we tell God to do. Right? So, so we take those texts that talk about if you pray and you believe that God will answer your prayer and that God will provide, but we take, we take God's will out of the equation. And we say, Lord, I'm a person of faith. I read my Bible. I pay my tithes. And you've got to do what I want you to do. No, God, God has a will also. And God, our will needs to line up with God's will. And a lot of times when we're praying for certain things, our will ain't lining up with God's will. And that's a problem. Amen. John H. Pankton says, over the last 60 years, several Christian authors have agreed that God's will has three parts. Here's the first one that, that the scholars say. He says, the first one is God's intentional will. God's intentional will. He says, these are the desires of God's heart for us. God's ideal plan flowing out of God's goodness, such as that none should be lost. Do you realize that God has a plan for your life? 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them who love him. God has a plan for your life. And God has an intentional will for your life. God has a goal, a desire, a destiny that God wants you to reach and fulfill in your life, but you may never get there or you may have a bumpy road getting there because God gave you free will and allows you to make your own choices, even it is, if it is out of what God intended for your life. That was a mouthful, but did y'all hear what I said? That's why it's so important to live your life in a way that it lines up with God's intentions for your life because God's intentional will is what's best for your life and it will give God the most glory. In everything that we say, in everything that we do, we ought to first ask, is this going to give God glory? Can you imagine how, how much better our relationships would be, how much better our churches would be if before we opened our mouths and before we committed certain actions or did certain things that we would question ourselves and say, is this going to glorify God? Is what's about to come out of my mouth going to give God glory? Is this decision, is my reaction going to glorify God, or is it going to do the opposite? Can you imagine how much the church could get accomplished if we put God first and foremost before we said things and did things or reacted to people if we just said, okay, is this going to give God glory? We, we, we need to practice that, y'all. That's, that's your homework assignment. For the rest of this week, before you open your mouth, before you say it, before you react to something somebody else has done or said to you, before you speak and act, ask yourself, whether it's out loud or whether it's in your spirit, ask yourself, is what I'm about to say, is what I'm about to do, is my reaction to my coworker or my wife or my husband or my child or my neighbor or my church member is my reaction to what they just said or did is my reaction going to glorify God. And if the answer is no, look at somebody and say, keep your mouth shut. Just keep your mouth shut. My mama used to tell me, boy, if you ain't got nothing good to say, don't say nothing. The problem is, we act out of our own humanness before we ever talk to God about it. If you're like me, 
a lot of times, this is how I know people have the Holy Spirit. Y'all know I like how I worship. I like to worship. I don't have no problem with people dancing or shouting or running. I don't have no problem with however you worship, whether that's quietly or whether that's a little bit more bodaciously. I don't really care. Uh, um, but, but, but we've got to get to a point where we understand that that is not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say it's not, but it's not the only sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit. I think that there are other more important signs. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, Deacon Dodd, we, we, we had a quick conversation about this last week. Sometimes the Spirit gets a hold of you and you respond physically. Sometimes it ain't the Spirit. Sometimes you like David. You just happy. You're just glad that God got you where you are, that God has been with you, that you're still alive, and so the Spirit don't get a hold of you, it's you. You say, I got to get a Lord some praise because God has been good to me, right? But here's how I know you really got the Spirit. Y'all want to know how? When those people that always say, the Lord told me, that's not necessarily a sign of the Spirit for me. Here's when I know you got the spirit. When the Lord tells you to keep your mouth shut. When you really got the spirit, there are going to be some times when something comes from your head, down your nervous system, and it hits your mouth, and the spirit is going to grab your mouth and clamp it shut. That's how I know when a person really has the spirit. They don't, they're not always saying the Lord told me this. Sometimes the Lord don't tell you to tell nobody something. Sometimes the Lord is telling you to be quiet, not to say what you're thinking about saying, and don't let it roll across your tongue. If the spirit never tells you to be quiet, I don't know what kind of spirit you have. Are y'all hearing me tonight? <clears throat> All right. Any questions or comments before we move forward? No, uh, 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 uh. did y'all hear that? She started off with sometimes people make you. Get, 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 her, get her the mic, y'all. Deke over there listening. He, he, we need a teenager in here to run with that mic. We coming to you. Hold on one sec. The people online need to hear you. Go ahead. It just comes out. Okay. She said it just comes out like she throwing up, right? <laughs> You don't, you don't feel it coming. Uh, you don't feel it coming. It just comes out and then it come out. Then you realize that it came out. You don't, you don't feel it coming. So you don't, you don't really feel it. You don't feel your flesh r rising. You don't feel your neck rolling a little bit. You don't feel none of that. It just come out. Okay, all right. I'm not going to debate that. <laughs> Listen, every day that God wakes you up. Y'all, we gotta do, we've got to do better because we have done God and the kingdom a disservice over the years because people are able to call us hypocrites because we say one thing, we talk all this Jesus stuff and we talk about love and grace and mercy and all of this stuff, but then we raise hell and we don't treat people right and we don't forgive people and we don't try to get along with people. And we got clicks just like the world has clicks. And we want to hang with some people, but we don't want other people to be a part of it. Are, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And the world looks at us when we on our job and we on the rampage, and then the next day you're talking about come to my revival next week. And you done cussed everybody out in the office. Why am I coming to your church and you won't even treat me right at work? Every day that God wakes you up, you ought to ask God like to him. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Amen. What? Thou art 
The what? The potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, God. Have thine own way. As a child of God, that ought to be our desire that God will use us to glorify him and his kingdom. Amen, my, I, amen myself. Amen. Every day that God wakes you up, you ought to ask God for God's will to be done in your life. Because God's will is what's best for your life, and that's what will bring glory to God in your life. I have lived long enough now to be able to look back over my life and understand that there have been some times that I have done things without God and ended up in trouble, but when I have sense enough to have that patience and wait on God to move me or to speak to me and tell me what to do, I always end up in a good place. I did not end up here at Emmanuel because I was just looking for a job and looking to come back home. Every church I've ever pastored, I prayed over it. When I was at Union, I said, okay, God, God told me that it was time for me to pastor. And I said, okay, God, then it's time for you to move me. Because if I move myself, I'm going to end up in a bad situation. Lord, I need you to put me where I belong. I was there 11 years. And then when I felt like I had gotten them as far as I could get them, I said, okay, Lord, I'm starting to sense that it's time for me to move on. If that's true, I need you to put me where I'm supposed to be. I don't know where that is. Well, I ended up going to Flint, Michigan. I didn't know why. Got there in the middle of that darn water crisis that everybody thinks is over and is not. And I had to hit the ground running and fighting and protesting and marching and all of this stuff. And I was able to leave a mark on that community. I was getting ready to run for mayor. Some of y'all know this. I had a team around me and they kept saying, man, when are you going to make your public announcement? When are you going to make your public announcement? Well, I had gotten a call from Avon Ruffin. She was the chair of the committee saying, Preacher, I've been trying to get in touch with you. We was getting ready to scratch your name off the list. I said, well, did you text me? <laughs> so, so she was like, we just want to know if you're still interested because you're in the final three. So now I'm getting ready to run for mayor. So what did I do? I said, yeah, I'm still interested. I immediately went back and talked to my wife and started praying. And I said, Lord, I did ask you for an opportunity to go back home. I said, but if I'm not supposed to be the pastor at Emmanuel, please close that door. I said, now stay here and run for mayor and try to help this community. I said, but if it's your will that I go back home, open that door and make it happen. See, we've got to be open to what God wants and not, it ain't always about what we want because a lot of times what we want is not going to end well. But if you allow God to have control of your life and put you where God wants you to be, God is going to bless wherever you are. Are y'all hearing me? Secondly, Painter says the second part of God's will is God's permissive will. This is what God will accept given our choices, good or bad, in particular circumstances, so as to not limit the free will that God has given us. God accepts that some will be lost. I didn't say God wants it. I didn't say God desires it. But God accepts it because of our free will. Matthew 18, 14 says, So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. God does not cause us to be lost or desire for us to be lost, but God permits it because of the choices that we make with our own free will. It is the same when it comes to evil, wickedness, and suffering in this world. That was not God's desire for humankind, but God permits it as a result of the choices that humankind has made and humankind continues to make right now. Human beings have a history that we tarnish and mess up everything that we touch. Can I say that again? We have a history that we tarnish and mess up everything that we touch. And we have been messing stuff up ever since God created us. Amen, somebody. 
Then Painter says the third part of God's will is God's ultimate will. All right? So, so this is how God achieves God's ends, giving humankind's choices, be they good or bad. He works all things together for the good of those he called who love him. This means God can ultimately get God's good in spite of humankind's bad. Y'all remember the story of Samson? The, the power of God was on Samson's life. God, God chose Samson, right? But Samson got full of himself. And he started walking around thinking he was the man. Forgetting that God had called him out from everybody else and there were certain things he wasn't supposed to participate in and certain things he was not supposed to do, but he got full of himself. And, and that is the quandary of human nature that God will bless us and we start having some successes and then we start taking credit for what God has done in our life. When you start taking credit, you know what that make, makes you? You have now replaced God with yourself. When you start saying, I did this. So look at Samson. God had an ultimate will for Samson's life. But Samson kept messing up, right? Till he finds himself with his eyes gouged out, chained between two columns. But God's ultimate will still occurred. Because the end of the story is, God used Samson to kill more of the enemy on that day when he pushed those columns down, when God gave him his strength back, he killed more people on that day than the army had killed the whole time they were fighting. So God's ultimate will was accomplished. Samson just made it hard on himself. When, when God says something's going to happen, guess what? You can't stop it. And if God says it is going to happen, ain't nothing you can do about it. That, that, that's how life and death is. If God says you ain't going nowhere, you ain't going nowhere. I don't care how sick you are. And if God says you're going somewhere, you're going somewhere. I don't care how healthy you are. We've got to understand that God has an ultimate will. And, and, and over the years, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going over here, but over, over the years, I have looked at how some of, some of the good people leave this earth early. You, you, you have a Question God about that. And sometimes I think, this is, this is Herb Miller talking. Sometimes I think, and I wrestle with this, I go back and forth. I, I had these discussions with me and God and myself. God took that person because their work was done. That's where I got to with my mama. Because I was struggling. I'm, Wait, why you take my mama, who helped everybody she could, had a kind word for everybody, would take furniture out of our house and give it to people who needed furniture, would take her last dime and give it away, would go pick people up and take them to the grocery store, take food out of our freezer and out of our refrigerator, and we ain't hardly have none ourselves, and she'd take half of it and go give it to somebody else. She was the nicest, sweetest Christian woman I had ever met. But God took her. And I believe her work was done. That's what I believe, and I can't prove it to you. But, but God has an ultimate will. Now, now, don't get it twisted and think that just because of God's permissive will, just because God allows evil, wickedness, and suffering to exist in the world, that God's will will not ultimately be done. I don't know who you think you are. You can think you all of that in a bag of chips, but you cannot stop God's ultimate will from coming to fruition. God's will will be done in spite of humankind's behavior. God moves when God wants to, how God wants to, when God wants to through whom or whatever God wants to, even through the behaviors of sinful human beings. No matter how chaotic, psychotic, and idiotic this world becomes, God's will will still be done. Are y'all hearing me? There is God's intentional will, what God desires for the world and for our personal lives. There is God's 
permissive will what God allows in spite of what God desires to not inhibit our ability to exercise our free will and to make our own choices, but then there is God's ultimate will. Ultimately, God's will shall be done. And guess what? There is nothing that anybody in this room or on Facebook or YouTube can do about it. God's will will still be done. Are y'all with me? When it's all said and done, God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's how the story ends, isn't that right? It's in the book, right? Those of you who've read the book, anybody got to the end of it yet? Y'all talk to me. I'm asking you a question. Talk to me. <laughs> Trying to keep y'all awake. What does it say in the end of the book? Huh? When you get to the book of Revelation, you discover that the Bible culminates with God's ultimate will coming to fruition. After all of these centuries and millennia of stuff and chaos and evil and suffering and wickedness and wars and rumors and wars and starving children and nations against nation and family members against family members, races against races, after all of this mess that we have done throughout human history, when we get to the end, God's ultimate will is still done, irregardless of what we've done in the meantime. I'm going to take a pause right here for any comments or questions. 716, I got just a few more minutes. I'm not going to get completely through this tonight. Anybody have any comments or questions before I move on? So now, we've gone back to the beginning, tracked down the progenitors, the, the originators, the trendsetters of disobedience that caused evil, wickedness, and suffering to enter into our existential reality, our human suffering, our human existence. For some reason, humans want to blame God for evil and suffering instead of blaming their fellow human beings. The first thing we must understand is that all of us will die from something. Unless we are still alive when the Lord comes back, or God takes you up in the whirlwind like Elijah or Enoch, part of the consequences of Adam and Eve's disobedience was difficulty in life and loss of eternal life. But then as history has progressed, us humans have continued to be disobedient to God and make wrong choices for humankind and for ourselves. And it is my contention that our blame of God is misplaced. First, we should blame Adam and Eve for not having eternal life and not living in paradise and having so much difficulty in this life. But I believe that Adam and Eve set this whole thing in motion and it will not cease until the end of days. Adam and Eve messed up by listening to a serpent or snake instead of listening to God. And it was not difficult for them to make that decision because I believe it was something they wanted to do anyhow. They were not forced to do it. They did it because they wanted to do it. Oh, and he said, we're going to be like God. Y'all know, y'all know that, that that's in us, right? That, that we want to be like God. We want to, we want to be in control. We want to determine what God's ultimate will really is. We want to decide the outcome. We, we, we move God out of the way and God has no place in our life because we're making all the decisions without constantly consulting God about God, what, what God wants for our lives. Amen, somebody. Are y'all with me? And some of us have gotten it twisted up, messed up, listening to some snakes in our own lives. They whisper in your ear, they put things in your spirit that go against God's will, and you go along with it because it sounds good, and it's always easier to do wrong than it is to discipline yourself and do right. But that same propensity, that same proclivity, that same predisposition to sin that was in Adam and Eve has been passed down to every single human being that has ever lived. And that's where evil and suffering comes from in this world. It comes from us human beings who have a desire to be like God and to be the God of our own lives. Thank you for that one amen. Did y'all hear what I said? 
It comes from our desire to be like God. And we want to be God of our own lives. But isn't that antithetical to Christianity and to what Jesus taught? I, do we even know what it means to be a Christian anymore? Does the church even know as a whole? Do, are we even trying? Are we really trying to display the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? Are we really trying to treat people right? Are we really trying to get along with folk? Are we really trying to glorify God? Because in a lot of our religious institutions, we are glorifying self instead of glorifying God. Do you know what I tell people when they say, man, I've been hearing things are going good at Emmanuel, and you know, y'all had a lot of members of joining yada, yada, yada. You know what I tell them? Man, it ain't me. It ain't me. God is doing something special in our midst, and God just happens to be using me as the pastor to facilitate some of it, but it's not me. Us pastors, if we are honest with folk, if we really tell the truth, most of the time, we don't know what the heck we doing anyhow. We praying and planning and say, Lord, show me the way. Show me how to get these people together. Show me how to reach the community. Show me how to walk like a Christian and talk like a Christian and behave like a Christian. Lord, help me to hold my peace and hold my mule when I want to do something else. But here's what I found out. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be perfect. But if you've got a willing heart, you're going to make some mistakes along the way, but God takes our imperfection and puts God's perfection on it and things work out to God's glory. Are y'all hearing me? And stop. Stop holding people to standards that you're not keeping yourself. Y'all know I have to go down these tributaries when I'm teaching. Stop holding people to standards that you can't keep in your own life. That is hypocritical and it is wrong. How are you going to hold me to this standard and your standards are here? Give people the benefit of the doubt. They might be having a bad day today. They might be not be feeling good today. They might have had something to happen at the house before they left the house and came to church or came to work. Just show love. If we can just show folks love, then we will be more in God's will than if we memorize the entire Bible. Is it really that hard to love folk? Is it really that hard to treat people right? Is it really that hard to do unto others as you want them to do unto you? as the Bible talks about? Is it really that hard? Well, it seems like it. Doesn't it seem like it to you? I'm, somebody said, no, it ain't that hard. Well, why, why ain't we doing it? I mean, we do some of it, but we, we, got, a lot, we got a lot of work to do. We got a long ways to get where God wants us to be. Are y'all hearing me? I got 723. I got just a few minutes. and We're going to end. It's my contention that all evil and suffering can be tracked back to humankind, not just Adam and Eve, because all of our names can really be switched to Adam and Eve, because we have the same modus operandi as they had. We are diabolic, deadly, disobedient children who have a sad, salacious, sociopathic, lustful longing for lascivious, sinful behavior that separates us from God and causes evil and suffering in this world. So if you want to blame someone for evil and suffering in the world, blame us, God's creation, not the creator. Most sickness in this world is not God inflicted. They are human inflicted. Most diseases in this world are caused or created by human error or human intention. That's how we got the coronavirus, through human experimentation and messing with stuff that we probably ought not be messing with. And somehow it got out into the world and infected the entire world and lives were lost because of it. If it's not by human experimentation, it's by human degradation. 
Human beings like to consume, co-mingle, and copulate with things that they are either prohibited by God or we know has the potential to cause disease. For example, we eat things that we should not eat, we lay with people and animals that we should not lay with, and we allow humans to live in filthy squalor that creates sickness and disease when we have the means to eliminate disease-infested conditions. Don't let me get on our diets because most of the diseases, sicknesses, and ailments that we suffer from have either been caused caused by human beings or caused by the foods that we eat, do you realize that most of the sickness we suffer from is a direct result of what we put in our bodies and most of them can be improved, corrected, or altogether eliminated if we just change our diets or our government quits force feeding us all of this trash? Do you realize that the government of the United States of America allows toxins, dangerous chemicals, insects, rodents, and foreign and fecal ma materials to be in most, if not all, of our foods. They actually allow a percentage of that stuff to be in our food. Do you realize that most of our food in the U.S. is processed foods that contain high amounts of salt and chemicals that are known carcinogens that cause cancers and so many other ailments and diseases? Do you realize that many of the medicines that are prescribed to us contain dangerous elements that cause side effects that cause problems in other organs in our body? It might be making you think this is fixed over here, but it's messing up a whole lot of other stuff over here. Not even to mention how we have abused this beautiful earth that God has given us to enjoy and take care of. There is a reason that we are experiencing so many hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanic eruptions, violent storms, blizzards, floods, and so much erratic weather. We have chemicals in our food. We have chemicals in our water. We have chemicals in our air. We have chemicals in our swimming pools. We have chemicals in our rivers and anything else you can think of that causes all types of viruses, diseases, and death, yet we want to blame God for all of the sickness and the suffering that goes on in the world when most of it is self-inflicted, and then we want to blame God for the behavior of people who have free will and are able to make their own choices just like us, but they decide that they want to live evil and wicked lives. It's not God's fault. The only thing you can blame God for is loving us enough to give us free will to make our own decisions. So if you want to blame somebody for evil and suffering in the world, blame humankind because humankind places a dollar over dignity. Humankind places power over people. Humankind places politics over principle. Humankind places billionaires over babies. Humankind places color over Christ. Humankind places business over beneficence. Humankind places wealth over the welfare of God's people. The problem with free will is that us human beings often make the wrong choices that diametrically oppose the will of our God, and then we must suffer the consequences, and then we turn around and blame Blame God for every single negative thing that happens in this world. But God is not the culprit, the cause or the creator of evil and suffering in this world. It is the human beings that he created and loves us so much that God wanted us to have free will to be able to make our own choices in our lives. And the ultimate choice that God wants us to make is to love him and serve him with all of our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Evil and suffering in this world is a direct result of us humans living and being out of God's will for our lives and for this earth. I do believe many of us have experienced that sometimes things happen to you that just blindside you. You've been eating right, you've been taking your vitamins, You've been working out, and next thing you know, you're sick. I, I, I get that. But what I'm telling you is that we ignore the fact that there was a time when everything was good. Ain't that the word God uses? Everything was good. And throughout millennia, all this stuff 
the stuff we, the air ain't even good. We don't know where all these cancers, we keep getting new cancers, stuff we ain't never heard of. And it may not have been because of your diet. It can be because of the environment that we have created. That we walk down the street and we breathing in stuff and don't even know we breathing it in. We're eating food. I told you, you can't eat nothing no more. I was watching TikTok. I'm a TikToker, y'all. So if they get rid of it, I'm going to have to find something else. I'm a TikTok. I sleep with TikTok on. My wife turns the TV off. I have my earphones in. And she said, you had your thumb on your, your laptop and you be sleep with your glasses on and your AirPods in your ears. I do. Because I, I sleep about three or four hours. I, 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 used, I have to sleep with the TV on. Right? This is how your environment affects you. Me and my sister have to sleep with the TV on because we grew up in a household where my dad had the TV up so loud that even with your door shut, you could hear the TV all night long. And he'd be in there in his recline asleep. So now me and my sister can't sleep without the TV on. Sometimes my wife would turn the TV off and I wake up. I say, hey, you turn the TV off. She said, you was over there snoring. Yeah, but you woke me up. So now I'm good. I done went through, I done tore up one pair of iPods. It's making all kind of noise. I had to go get me a new pair because I sleep with them in my ears so I can hear that talking in the background that puts me to sleep. No, she turns the TV off once I put, when I put them earplugs in, with AirPods in. So, so y'all, uh, uh, I was watching this TikTok, and the lady, she went and got some coffee, and then she heard somebody say what was wrong with coffee. She went and got some chicken, then she saw the news thing and said something was wrong with the chicken. She went and got some vegetables, then something came up and said something was wrong with the vegetables. Everything she touched, it, it said it was contaminated. It can make you sick till finally. She said, just forget it. I ain't going to eat nothing. And it was a joke, but that's the world that we live in. We have degraded the earth so much, we can't even agree that the water's rising. You might not believe in global warming, but at least you ought to believe in climate change because... Y'all remember, it never rains in Southern California. Well, it's raining all the time now. It even snowed this past year in Southern California. You got to at least admit the climate is changing. And where is it coming from? It could come from cycles. The earth goes through, through cycles. But then all the pollutants that we put in the air makes the weather more erratic. And that has been proven. So now you got people trying to keep their houses from falling in the ocean because the water's still rising. It's snowing in Southern California. They don't even need to play that song no more. I used to love that song. Both versions of it. But it's raining in Southern California now. They had floods everywhere. Y'all, I'm trying to tell you, and we're going home. It's 732. We're going home. We need to be careful of blaming God for all of the evil, suffering, and wickedness that we see. Because I'm not of the opinion that most of it comes from us. God does not shoot anybody. God didn't put these chemicals in the air. God doesn't, didn't tell us to process our food and put all this stuff in it. Don't mess around and go on uh, YouTube and start looking up what foods are made out of. You're going to starve yourself to death. I mean, even a dog on chicken nugget is made out of fluid. And they put all this stuff in it and makes it look like real meat. Okay, it's 7.33. I'm done, y'all. Uh, any questions or comments before we go? Yes, sir. Uh, get, get him the mic, D. Got to remember our folks online are listening. <laughs> That's why we die. That's why we die. <laughs> He's going to surely die. So now that, you know, and still his compassion is still will because, you know what, he put him out the house, but he was still will. You mm -hmm. know, and that's the thing about it. God never leaves us, even in our mess. Even when we don't listen to him, he still has compassion on us. And so we can't blame nobody. We really can't blame uh, Adam and Eve to me. It's just the fact that they just didn't listen. 
And how many times mom told you not to do something you didn't do? Don't eat that. It ain't good for you. You ate it anyway. Next thing you know, I'll feel. So, therefore, I just think that God gave those directives. If they had a list, I think they would have been all right. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice just to be hanging out in the garden of Eden? <laughs> ain't got to go to work in the morning. I ain't got to worry about getting sick. I ain't got the farm. I can just pick food off of the tree and eat it. I ain't even going there. I ain't going there. Not tonight. <laughs> but, here, but here's the thing. When it's all said and done, God's ultimate will is going to flip everything back to where God originally intended it to be. Right? Because we're going to get what? A new heaven, a new earth, and new Jerusalem. It's going to be the paradise. And, and, and I don't know, I already told you, I might, get, I might get put in ISS or something when I get to heaven. <laughs> Y'all gonna say, Pastor, why are you in that room sitting in there with Gabriel or whoever that is? You in there? I got in trouble, man. I done told some stuff up because when I saw the Lord, I went to running and started knocking stuff down. <laughs> Any other comments or questions before we go tonight? All right. Thank you all uh, for coming out tonight. Um, let me see. He just walked out. I'm going to ask Deacon Wall uh, if he would lead us out in a word of prayer. And take this microphone. I think he took the mic with him. Amen. Let us all stand. Who? Oh, the bridge that collapsed with all the people on it. Did y'all see that? Pray, Deacon Wall. Okay. <laughs> Who else? Is that it? Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time that's been spent in this hour. Learning, Father God, that we all make mistakes when we are turning our backs on you, God, and not listen to what you have told us not to do. And we take things into our own matter and do what we want to do. But, Father God, we pray that you will continue to be with us and help us along our way. Mm -hmm. Father God, help us to seek your face and inquire of you of what we need to do to make our lives better and for the kingdom of, of, the, of, your, of, of, your, of your, your kingdom. Lord, we pray now for those that are sick among us. We pray, Lord, for those who lost loved ones on a tragedy on that bridge in Baltimore today, God. And we pray, Father God, that you were, they will find uh, peace in their hearts, the families. And we pray, God, for strength of our church and our pastor. We pray, God, that you continue to lead and guide and direct our every footstep that you get the glory out of all our lives. Mm -hmm. Because, Lord, we can't do nothing without you. And we pray, God, that you continue to look beyond our faults each and every day and forgive us of our sins and our trespasses. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.